Hello, and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we are continuing our discussion on The Border Simulator by Gabriel Lozal. Today, we're joined by Gabriel himself. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having <laughs> me. Yeah, hey. great, great to be here. Uh, yeah, welcome back to Chuco. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Mm-hmm. I mean... I hope I get to come back uh, permanently at some point. Mm. Um, that's, I think that's me and my mm. wife's dream is to be able to like l- come back and live here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love Tucson. We love other places we've been. But like, like I told you earlier, all our families from here, mm-hmm. you know, all, all my, I love El Paso. It's, it's, it's the best. And actually, maybe we could start with that. Um, for our listeners, like, could you give us like a brief bio of like uh, your upbringing here and like where you ended up and, and what you studied? Yeah, sure. Um, Going to the very start, I was born in Alpine, Texas, actually, which is just like a, a coincidence because my mom was attending Sol Ross University there. Yeah. Um, but I don't have any connection. And in fact, I didn't even return to Alpine until I was in my in my 20s, or until I was an adult. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up um, in the lower valley of El Paso. I went to Riverside High School. Um, I took my first uh, creative writing classes there. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, I was interested in writing since then and um, went to El Paso Community College, kind of took a break and I was in bands and stuff. Um, there's, I was in a band called the Dozal Brothers, um, which, uh, which we had a lot of fun doing, me and my brother doing stuff in the like late 2000s, right? 2007, 8, 9. Um, but then I realized like I wasn't a good enough musician to continue that path. My brother is, the, is an amazing genius musician. I'm not. <laughs> and by the time I was like 25, 26, I'm like, you know what, I'm not that great of a musician. This It's going to take a lot more work to kind of break into the music industry. I'm tired of staying up till 3 a.m. waiting to get paid from like a smelly bar manager or something like that. <laughs> so, um, so I was like, you know, I'm going to return to uh, writing. You know, uh, my uh, dad was a middle school art teacher at Eastwood Middle School for 28 years. Um, and that's that's what he passed down to me is like teaching pedagogy stuff and art stuff. I can't draw to save my life, but, um, you know, I knew I wanted to keep going with some kind of like art form and I've always loved writing and poetry. So I kept up with that. Um, got my associates at El Paso Community College, uh, then, uh, transferred to, uh, UTEP where UTEP has a kick ass writing program. You know, I mean, I, 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 I'm assuming that's still the case. It seems like that's still the case. But what I mean also by kick-ass is that it, um, there was lots of different kinds of writers, right? So Rosa Alcala was kind of like my close mentor, mm-hmm. but I also took clashes with Ben Sines. He yeah. was still teaching there at the time. Daniel Chacon, uh, Sasha Pimentel has a different kind of outlook on how poetry works compared to Rosa. I took classes with Jeff Serkin. I, I, I mean, I should have graduated much sooner than I did. It probably took me like six years to graduate. Because mm-hmm. I took every creative writing class mm-hmm. I could. Uh, Lex okay. Williford, mm-hmm. Jose uh, de Pierola. Mm-hmm. I took everyone. Everyone mm-hmm. who was there, I took, mm-hmm. a, I took a class with him. Um, so I got a nice, rounded, I think, education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was also older, too. I was like 26. So most of my classmates were 18 or 19. Mm-hmm. They're trying to figure out what beer tastes like. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. and I was a little more serious than everyone. I mm-hmm. took it a little more serious, right? I was like, hey, I'm here to do this. I'm yeah. here to work hard and, like, hone my craft so um so I think that helped me with the teachers too so I got great letters of recommendation I took a couple Mm -hmm. years off and moved to DC and then I I got into the uh University of Arizona's MFA program um and that was a three-year program and had a lot of assistance and help there too so yeah I think that's kind of like my my writing kind of like journey Mm. yeah Mm. cool (laughs) (laughs) it's always nice to to hear um not just about like writers that come out of community college, but just, you know, the support that you had in all of these areas and like the, the teachers that you can still name, you know, that's, that's kind Mm -hmm. of nice because a lot of times they're like, Oh yeah, there's this teacher. Like while they're in someone's class, they can't even tell you the name of their (laughs) professor. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're in their class right now. (laughs) But so that's kind of nice, you know? Yeah, I was paying. I was paying attention. Like I'm, I'm, I'm 100 like a try hard student. I'm like the annoying student who, like, as soon as they ask a question, I'm like, mm. I did the reading. I did all. I did all the homework. I'm ready yeah. to answer the question. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, yeah, like I, but I collected so many great little nuggets of advice when it came to mm-hmm. writing. When it comes to like forming mm-hmm. 
uh, a narrative or, uh, you know, organizing a poem. I feel like I got all kinds of great little tips from all those instructors, mm -hmm. right? So you said you started or um, you wrote and took creative writing classes in high school. Yeah. Were you immediately drawn to poetry or did you do a little bit of fiction? Yeah, it was poetry uh, that I was, I was really interested in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote poems in that in those creative writing classes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's because it's the short form. Um, I mean, I guess I really liked the beat poets, uh, like my freshman, sophomore year in high school, right? Like mm -hmm. Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac. I think those are great writers to read when you're 13 or 14, right? They're like mm -hmm. hopping on trains and mm -hmm. doing drugs and, and having a lot, <laughs> seemingly having a lot of fun in a creative, in a creative way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I discovered through Allen Ginsberg's Howl, uh, William Carlos Williams, he writes the, like the foreword to Howl. He writes like the intro or the or foreword or something like that. And at Riverside High School, they had a VHS tape of like this poetry series that PBS did. And one of them was William Carlos Williams. I'm like, oh, hey, I know, I know that guy. So from there, from, from Allen Ginsberg and the beat poets, then I discovered William Carlos Williams, who's more of like a modernist writer mm -hmm. right he's not he's not he wasn't part of he was before the beat generation and that kind of like led me down the path to a lot of other different kind of poets mm -hmm. um and yeah so it was always poetry were you modeling your poetry after them or what did it already have a little hint of like your current you know uh type of poetry no my, <laughs> my dad recently sent me a poem that he kept of mine mm -hmm. from like it was actually community college days but <laughs> I was very, it was very cringe. I was very, uh, <laughs> but my dad was like, yeah, mijo, I knew that you were going to succeed. And I was reading this poem. I'm like, yeah, this is real cringy. This is, well, we, we do have access to the chrysalis. Oh yeah. oh yeah. <laughs> you should, you should, yeah. you should, you should look it up. It's, okay. I mean, I don't think they're bad for, for being, you know, my kind of like first attempts and stuff or, or getting published in chrysalis. You should, 2005, I think. I think that's I think that's yeah that's when, when I have some I have some chrysalis stuff in there, um, which I know there's an open reading period. I want to submit some stuff to chrysalis because mm. I think that'd be badass. Yeah, to, yeah. To yeah. Like, yeah. I think it just opened. Yeah, yeah we did, just yeah. opened. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Real Grande Review too. I want to. I don't know mm. if you have any connections to that either, but no. I know the uh, editor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. oh. yeah. I mean that was I mean that's my dream growing up is like to have something in Real Grande Review, right? And, yeah. Um, so I, maybe we can make that happen. But yeah, but chrysalis yeah. too. I think it'd be so cool to like have a poem in yeah. in, in chrysalis. That'd be badass. But yeah, yeah. I, I really like the idea of the gateway poets. <laughs> totally, yeah. totally. That's and works so well with the beats. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Said, yeah. That's that's Richie's cup of tea right there. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Same and reasons. I, I still I still like them too, right? Um, but um, but yeah, that, like that that was definitely the gateway to to there, right? I guess also I think I first started reading though freshman year in high school because a girl I really liked um, was reading 1984. And so I was, I was like, okay, I want to read 1984 so I could have something to talk to this girl about yeah. the rest of my year of high school. But then I really loved the book, 1984. And, and, mm -hmm. then, and then that kind of like led me to the beats and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, I mean, we did have a, first of all, thanks for adding to our, our literary canon of the border. It just, it's nice mm -hmm. to oh, yeah. have yeah. more and more books each year like that we can celebrate and, and discuss. Oh, totally. yeah. Something yeah. as perplex and complex and, you know, as the border and... The Border Simulator. So I, I think one of the questions we wanted to ask is, is what inspired you to reimagine the U.S.-Mexico border here as a simulation? You know, I, I feel like it chose me, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I've talked about this before, but I, I, early on I didn't want to write about the border because it seemed like the most obvious thing. It also seemed like... Um, like everyone wrote about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like a man's like, or I didn't want to be pigeonholed. It's like, why can't I write about something else? This is when I was like 16, 17, 18, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then when you move away from El Paso and you realize how little anyone knows about the border mm -hmm. and how it works, um, then I think it snapped with me, like how important it is, right? But then also just the metaphor of the border too, I felt like, really was appropriate for the things I'm writing about for our current moment as well, right? There, it, it's, it's a metaphor with a lot of depth that I can explore and mine. Also, I feel like, you know, um, poetry of the past 15, 20 years, maybe it's always been like this, has been very identity focused, right? It's mm -hmm. like your identity 
is represented in your in your poetry, right? Mm-hmm. And you can disagree with me if, if if you'd like, but I feel like that's a big theme. So I felt like even it's it's funny. At first, I felt constricted when I was sixteen, seventeen, eighteen by the border, right? Mm. But I actually found so much freedom in writing about the border because I realized I could write about anything I wanted as long as it was it was in the language of the border because I knew no one could take that away from me, right? No one can say like, "Hey, wait a minute, are you? Should you be writing this? Can you be writing?" It's like I'm writing about the border. It's where I'm from. You can't take that away from me, right? Mm. Um, so I actually found a lot of freedom in writing about the border. In fact, I can't, it's hard for me to stop writing this kind of style of poems. I, I've, I'm trying to write prose. I'm trying to go in other directions. And I kind of keep reverting to this kind of like machine that I built um, where I can like take something I really care about that's in the news or something that's happening in journalism or happen, something that's happening online, right? Or like you know, how we interact with social media. I can take cool phrases and I can weave it into these stories about Primitivo and Primitiva mm-hmm. on, on the border, right? Um, and And then phones are ubiquitous now too, right? I mean, no matter where you live, you're on Facebook or TikTok or, you know, or Snapchat or Instagram or what have you, right? It's like everyone, everyone has this too. Yeah. Um, so anyways, yeah, like, so, I mean, of course, I, I, I want to represent something like my experience at the border, right? Of course, I love being mm-hmm. from here, but I found it as almost like a sneaky way to actually talk about anything that I wanted and also talk about the border at the same time. It kind of became something I couldn't... Um, I couldn't like escape, uh, but I am em- kind of embraced it, I guess. Mm. And when you were younger, would you go to Juarez or like regularly with with your folks? Or? Not super regularly, but uh, maybe like once every couple of months or something. I've got family that live there. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'd go visit them, or they'd come visit us. I didn't spend a whole lot of time in in Juarez. I probably went a little bit more when I was older, um, like in my mid or late twenties, uh, going to like hard pop. Or yeah, going to party yeah. in in Juarez, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, not not a whole lot. There wasn't a whole lot of partying in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, party was yeah, a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, party was that a big part of it. That was the focus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I got I was like grounded forever. Um, uh, I kind of hope my parents don't listen to this, but <laughs> when I was like when I was fourteen, I was arrested for uh, possession of marijuana. Um, and it was like the first time I had bought marijuana too. Like, and I had, this is like the nastiest, like tons of seeds and stems and everything. It was a total bad accident, like total like random thing where um, a bunch of my friends were smoking pot in a park. I showed up afterwards and one of my friends was there, but then the cops pulled up and were like, we got a mess. We got a call. A bunch of kids were smoking pot in the park. Yeah. And I happened to have like a tiny little bit of marijuana. So after that, I was just grounded forever. So when I turned 18, I was like basically still grounded and I, I wasn't going to Wattis to go party. You know? yeah. 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 Um, you'd mentioned Primitivo, Primitiva. So yeah. uh, I guess my question was like how... Or, or why these two characters, um, and I guess, was it more difficult to to create these poems around these two characters and weaving them into the, the collection? Or was it something that you always had, like, from the beginning uh, when you started writing these? You know, I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how to, like, develop a character, mm-hmm. right? Like, I, th- I think early on when I was writing, like, early poems that didn't quite make it into the book, I was trying to figure out, like, how do I write a poem or poems that are based around character Mm -hmm. because um so i'm an editor for diagram magazine which is a small literary journal i was a i was an editor for sonora review which is like the mfa run literary magazine from the university of arizona and you read so many poems with very vague pronouns you know they begin with i he she they and you can't place yourself exactly in the situation so I really wanted, to, and I really appreciate it now when I read poems that have a specific name or they set you specifically in a world immediately. So that's what I wanted with, with that, with to have like character, a, a character or two characters that the reader could enter into the world or try to understand them uh, more quickly. So the very last section of the book was actually the first section. The book's really written in reverse order. The oldest poems are at the very end. So at, at first, I didn't have characters. And my plan was just to have it in second person, you. Mm-hmm. And all the poems in that last section are in second person. It's you, you. It's like I'm talking to the reader. Mm-hmm. And I really like those poems, and some of those were published. Um, 
So I wanted to still to keep them. So I organized it so that the end of the book is kind of like this, like all the characters have left, all the like a kind of identity has been kind of stripped away mm -hmm. or a layer of it has been stripped away. And now it's just in the second person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, the name Primitivo, I'm, I have family, like older family that are named Primitivo, but I met like a farmhand named Primitivo in Patagonia, Arizona, um, part of uh, this project that the University of Arizona does uh, that encourages uh, writers to go to the border and kind of write, write about it. Um, and when I heard that name, I was like, wow, that is a perfect, that's a perfect name. I mean, as, as you know, there's like a lot of punning. There's a lot of like language play mm -hmm. yeah. within the book, <laughs> right? So when I told that name to someone down there, they were like, wait, his name is like primitive? It's primitive? I'm like, no, 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 primitiva just means like firstborn or something like that, right? But then right there too, I'm like, ah, I love like the misheard language game, right? Mm -hmm. The original title of this book was going to be Eso Son Ribaco Son Nike. <laughs> like the meme, right? Because yeah. and it's in the book. It's in. It's in. Yeah. It's in. Yeah. It's at the end, right? But that misheard lyric, that mistranslation mm -hmm. of you know English to Spanish, right? Even though it's mm -hmm. really a silly, dumb meme, I actually thought there was like a lot of depth there. That's actually a beautiful mm -hmm. kind of like misheard phrase from a song, El Tiburón, that mixes English and Spanish as well, right? That Spanish is also like a bilingual song, even though I think they're from like Dominican Republic or something like that, or I think I feel like they're from the Caribbean, but still. Um, so yeah, anyway, so primitivo, primitiva, like kind of a neat way to like pun off some words, give an homage to like an older kind of generation or an older name, mm -hmm. right, that doesn't really exist. Um, yeah, I think those were the initial reasons why I kind of picked those, yeah. pick yeah. those names. That's really mm -hmm. cool in thinking about poetry because uh, like you said, with most poetry that you read, it's it's the speaker, and we always refer to them as the speaker. We don't mm -hmm. give them names. It's you know because they don't have names, um, and it's just usually in second person or in first person. And so that's that's kind of a really interesting um, exercise. That maybe we could um, try to incorporate in our in our poetry classes and see if we can start building characters mm -hmm. in poetry. Yeah, <laughs> man. and let me tell you, it's like you're filling a gap a little bit, right? Because there's so few poems that deal with character names, mm -hmm. right? So as, act, as an editor, when I see that, it's really exciting. Because you get so many vague mm -hmm. pronoun poems, yeah. right? Where it's hard to place yourself. And yes, the language can be dynamic and that, that can, not all poems have to have proper names, right? But there's so little of that. Just tell your students, like, hey, like it, you stand out a little bit more mm -hmm. when an editor's reading the slush pile, right? And they're reading hundreds and hundreds of poems. When you see a proper name, I'm like, oh, a proper name. I can imagine, like, even if it's just like, you know, Rodrigo. It's like, oh, I can kind of imagine that a little bit more than a than a vague pronoun. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll, I'll ask another question. Yeah. <laughs> like going off of that, um, primitivo. Um, I thought it was interesting because obviously the border is such a complex topic to write about and talk about, um, but to also make one of the main characters work for customs. I thought that was like adding another layer to it. Mm -hmm. um, was that always your idea or was that something that you kind of developed as you were writing the poems or like, oh, what was yeah. that cho like the reasoning behind the choice? Definitely. Right. I can't exactly remember when that happened or when I decided that. Um, but uh, for instance, I have a cousin who's a customs agent, right? Mm -hmm. In my MFA program at the U of A, when um, I had a, a friend who was reading these poems in a workshop and she asked me, is it, is it true that Mexican Americans work for border patrol and customs? And I was mm. like, yeah, yeah, it is. It's like half their workforce. Right. Mm -hmm. So that cl something clicked in my mind, too. It's like people don't know that mm -hmm. if you're not from the border, you don't really know how many people mm -hmm. work for border and customs. And we know that, hey. You don't have to have a college degree and you get paid really well, right? Mm -hmm. Like like just looking at it from an economic standpoint, it's a great job, right? I talk to people who work for Customs and Border Patrol, right? Not taking morality, like not thinking about the moral part of it, right? I mean, so anyways, so that is something that I wanted to show as a part of like the complexity of what it's like to live here, right? The mm -hmm. irony, right? The What a lot of people might not be aware of or know about. And also it's my family too, right? I mean... Everyone loves my cousin Liz, who's a customs agent. She's providing for her family, right? Like I have other 
uh, family members who kind of like are deadbeat dads or left their left their homes and don't take care of their children. They're uh, alcoholics. You know, Liz is an outstanding member of this of, of our community and my and my uh, uh, and my world too, right? Which already kind of like goes against a lot of like the ethos of um, what it's like to be in a poetry community, right? Especially like in Tucson. I know this is the case. I don't know exactly. I've been a little out of touch from El Paso for a while, but people refer to Border Patrol as Murder Patrol, right? Mm. Mm. And yeah, of course, there's some terrible things that Border Patrol has done, right? I'm not looking to defend them either, but I want to present this reality mm-hmm. that it's like my one set of my grandparents came here illegally. Mm-hmm. And now my cousin, who is a descendant, is in charge of checking your passport at the port of entry, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's um, something that I think growing up, it just seemed kind of like obvious or unremarkable. But when you, when you speak to people who don't know about the border, that's, uh, I think that's something that's, re- that's really remarkable. It also adds tension to the book. It adds, it adds this level of conflicting um, uh, energy that, mm-hmm. I, that I wanted. Because um, I didn't want it to be smooth and perfect and all the characters have the perfect ideas or the right ideas or the correct morals, right? That's a big, that's something that I think a lot about, um, especially like as an artist. Uh, the, the very last line of the poem, The Border Simulator, right? The very last line, it's, were you pure of heart when you wrote this thing or what? Hmm. Like someone asking, hey, were you pure of heart when mm-hmm. you wrote this thing? Hmm. Like as if making fun of this idea that to write a book of poetry or to represent a community, you have to have this pure moral outlook, right? And I'm like, man, that strips away a lot of energy. That strips away a lot of places where there's tension. And you got to have tension in a work of art, right? There's got to be some competing ideas. At least that's the way I wanted mine to work. And kind of going off of Vanessa's question, uh, we did talk a lot about some of the influences that, you know, the Matrix, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I had brought up a sleep dealer, uh, which yeah. is, and, and so I wanted to ask, like, was that one of the influences? hundred okay. percent. Yeah, absolutely. So as I started writing poems about the border simulator, right in the MFA program, everyone knew me as like the border simulator guy, right? Like I have an aunt who loves frogs. And so <laughs> throughout the years, everyone just gives her frog stuff for her birthday, right? She's like, the frog lady. I became the border simulator guy. <laughs> um, so I started, everyone started sending me examples of this border simulator. So I wasn't aware of Sleep Dealer when I was writing uh, the early poems, right? Yeah. But of course, mm-hmm. that, that, that movie is full of all kinds of great metaphors. That, and some of those made it into the book for sure, right? Mm-hmm. Big influence, right? Um, the director, uh, Iñárritu, right? He had this like art piece that was like a border simulator. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like in L.A. Do you know about mm-hmm. this? Yeah. Um, there's that. There's a video. I found out there's a video game that um, some computer engineers from UTEP made in like 2000 called Border Simulator Crosser or something like that, mm. where it's like it was very like, mm. uh, like primitive, like 16-bit or 8-bit mm-hmm. game, kind of like Frogger. Mm. but it's like someone crossing the desert. There's one in Arizona too called Papers, Please. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Papers, Please. So though, or, or the Roblox stuff. I know Roblox has like some kind of like a uh, border simulator type of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. like you, I, you start to collect all of these different, uh, like it's not a, a novel concept, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's lots of similar things, right? But I also thought, I mean, there's room for more, right? And mine is different from all of those right mm-hmm. it's it's my own kind of take it's my own uh kind of way of that so at first i felt like oh my god or for a while i was like hoping please no one write a book called the border simulator please <laughs> please please, please. <laughs> there was a book called um um border apocrypha mm. uh by cody oh, I'm gonna, i can't remember his last name right now his first name is cody <laughs> uh cody anthony or it's Anthony Cody, Anthony Cody, Anthony Cody. There you go. Anthony Cody. And Apocrypha is like, eh, you know, it's not at the word simulator, but it's like, oh, it's, it's close, right? So I was like, oh, thank God no one wrote a, a book called The Border Simulator. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. Like that, other, other influences, right? I kind of like riff off of some of those ideas and definitely yeah. made it in there. Yeah, on that, on that point, uh, you know, there's a lot of reference to modern... Uh, lingo, internet lingo, slang, and yeah. technology. So, um, 
just I guess to hear your perspective on the role technology plays in our perception of, of the border and especially how you explore it in your in your in your work. Yeah. You know, I don't know always when or how intentional it was to have technology and the border merge together. I mean, it was intentional, but I don't always know exactly what the statement is going to say. I kind of let the language kind of lead me, but it was very important to me to have modern technology in the book because there's so little of it. Just like I was talking about earlier about like vague Mm. pronouns, you rarely see technology in poetry or literature, right? Like I'm talking about like 2024 language and stuff. And Mm. even like, there's not a whole lot of it in the book because some of this was written in 2018, 2019. That's that's kind of when I started writing the first, the first versions of these poems, right? But I wanted the book as much as possible to be of this moment, right? And to be identifiable as this moment. So that's why TikTok is in there. Um, That's why uh, there's some language about like uh, filters, right? And like screens and faces uh, shifting or morphing. Uh, uh, copy pasta, right? Yeah, like creep, yeah. creepy pasta, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, there is gold in the language of technology because there's new words, new language, mm, new. M- there's metaphors waiting to be mined. There's so much depth in the world of technology, and no one's taking advantage of it. Mm. And it, I, there's not there's not even as much as I would like to put. Uh, in the book, right? There's a lot of awesome metaphors that are popping up every single day. Technology is moving and evolving so, so fast. We're getting all kinds of language. And then with AI and ChatGPT now, there's even another layer of depth there. Mm -hmm. It was just too good, too too many (laughs) amazing kind of metaphors that I could use and borrow here. Do you think that that um, is, I mean, you're you're presenting it in a very positive way. Totally. However, just devil's advocate, mm-hmm. do you think that people choose to write more universally so that it can span like longer times and people will, readers will come back to these poems and be like, okay, I can understand this versus seeing TikTok. What is TikTok having to look it up? You know what I mean? <laughs> 100%, right? And, and I'm not advocating that everyone should be writing technology poems, right? Mm-hmm. There's a place for any kind of genre, 100%, right? But it's... The, I mean, so I'm 39 years old. I'm about to turn 40. I was born in 1984. I remember vividly being incredibly bored in the summer of 1996 because there was nothing to do, right? <laughs> when are we ever bored now, right? Mm-hmm. I have seen a technology completely change and shift our world. Mm-hmm. The world I grew up in in 1997 is a 180 degree way that people are growing up now. We all know it, mm-hmm. right? We all know this, right? But that change, that shift, right? There's so much to explore there. And that's why also, like, absolutely, that was, that was something I thought about and was concerned about, right? Okay, so this technology will eventually go out of fashion, right? But there's lots of technology in here that is referencing older stuff, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. There's a Rolodex, mm-hmm. right? There's a Rolodex thing. There's a, there's, I think there's some VHS tape. There's like, like a handheld camera recorder, mm-hmm. right? Now this is just like history, that's like yeah. bringing that up, right? Yeah. Um, so I absolutely wanted there to be like this older type of technology mixed in with this new technology, and absolutely it's going to get past. I also feel though that um, you know even if it's not technology, I mean you can date a poem pretty well, mm-hmm. right? Mm. Depending on what it is, you could you could you can kind of tell by the references or what's happening, right? right. Where it's from. So that's something that that is inevitable, anyways. Yeah. Like the Matrix, you know, there's people nowadays that have never even seen the Matrix. Dude, that movie holds up. That movie's okay. so good still. I watched it just a couple of years ago and I'm like, it it still rocks. Yeah, it's still no. awesome. I was watching it the other night one, I mean, and I was yeah. like, uh, I need to just we've been talking about it so much in in um our uh, episodes that we've been recording talking yeah. about the border simulator, we keep talking about it. So I was like, I need to rewatch this. There, <laughs> there's a scene from the matrix in the book, the cat, right? the cat, yeah. the cat, yeah, the yeah. cat. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You see a cat and then you see it twice. Right? Classic. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's my strategy. A lot of the time is like, I'm watching movies or I'm listening to something and I'm just riffing off the language. I'm riffing off the images. And then mm-hmm. later I try to weave together a cohesive thing. 
right? But I just, little snatches, little bits of language or cool imagery, I collect those, like as if I'm collecting material for a sculpture or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I weave, weave it all together. Like nothing is pre-planned. It's all in the, e in the editing process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you talk a lot about like the the playfulness, the the malleability of language, being able to throw in puns. Yeah, how important in it was it for you to also like incorporate this like lightheartedness, playfulness, and when you know the border can be a very like heavy tragic thing. I mean, you cover all that, you know, but important to be able to explore the playfulness of it too. Hundred percent, because that's something that if you're not from the border, you only hear about the kids mm. in cages. You only hear about the sad stories of people trying to cross the border, right? Yeah. And of course I wanted to be have that in here, right? Mm -hmm. I mentioned how I lived in DC before this, right? I worked in a bakery. Um, when I, when I, right outside of high school, I worked at a German bakery, Peter's German bakery, which still exists. It's far on the OS side here in El Paso. And uh, I learned how to shape bread and shape dough. Um, so in DC, I got a job. All of my coworkers were from Central America. All of them were from El Salvador, from Guatemala, from Honduras. I mean, this is the case also from Latinos that I know here. We're hilarious. We've got jokes. We've got puns in both languages, <laughs> right? All over the place. Mm. And I'm like, again, talking about the identity thing or how I chose to write about this, right? I'm like, I want the fun. I want the joy. I want the language play to be in here because it's a mix of those two things, right? Mm. Absolutely, this is the cross-section of amazing and incredibly sad, terrible stories mixed in with this life, this joy, this wordplay, these puns, these jokes that allows these people, allows us to keep on rocking, to keep on being a part of this world without having it beat us down. The Salvadorian coworkers I knew, they were the happiest, funniest, jokiest, most hardworking people. They put all of us to shame. All of the Americanos, and I'll put myself in there too. I mean, I grew up here. I'm definitely more American than I am, you know, Mexican, right? I mean, they they worked way harder than us, and they were having the time of their life. They made it. They're like, I'm in America. I'm, you know, making bread. I'm making money. I'm making, you know, like, like both both kind of like puns there, and and uh, like just having the time of their lives, right? Mm. But if you looked at it from a different perspective, you'd say like, oh these poor these poor immigrants or something like that right mm -hmm. so by giving them jokes by giving them by giving the book a kind of language play i'm also giving them kind of like this freedom of expression um, which we know is here which we know exists mm -hmm. right yeah. right so it's a more full scope right it's a more fuller kind of like voice than i'm able to give to to the poems it's awesome yeah i, I also just as a note I really love, I think there's a, an instance where you use tuba as a verb in there, like, yeah. corridos tuba out of a, yeah. like, that's awesome, I love that, yeah. and I know exactly what that is. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know you do, I know you do, right? So there, there's this, one of my favorite kind of ways to create language, right? Because that's what I do first, I, like I said earlier, I'm not trying to create a narrative or characters, I'm just trying to create language. I'll take prose pieces, and I'll write them backwards, from the last word to the first word. So you get this reversed syntax, where nouns become verbs, verbs becomes nouns, adjectives are in mm. different spots. Thoughts, right and then you try to work through this backwards yoda language hmm. right mm -hmm. forwards and then you get stuff like this like tuba becoming a, a verb mm. instead of instead of a noun right mm -hmm. um so yeah like that's like one of these kind of like language machine games that i that i use to try to create dynamic interesting uh language for poems mm -hmm. So this is your style outside of border simulator also you do a lot of wordplay and and if you're thinking that you write? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely there, right? Even in the prose, I'm trying to write. Um, so I, I, I can't not mention my favorite author, Elfrida Jelinek. Everyone should pick up a book of Elfrida Jelinek. I have one here. <laughs> um, Elfrida Jelinek, she won the uh, Nobel Prize in Literature in 2004. No one has ever read Elfrida Jelinek. She writes about, uh, or have you guys read Elfrida Jelinek? No, okay, no. because uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe maybe you guys are big Elfrida Jelinek fans. She won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2004. She writes her her books from the early from the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, and maybe still a little bit are about Austria's Nazi past. They are darkly, disturbingly funny. Tons of wordplay, tons of play with language. 
She's a huge influence on the book. I thank her in the end. I'm like, Elfrida Jelinek, I write in your shadow. She's mm-hmm. still alive. She's still writing. She mostly writes plays now. She doesn't write novels. She's kind of stopped writing novels. Um, but this style, this darkly funny, punny wordplay. I think a big reason why a lot of people haven't read her is because she writes in German. She's from Austria, right? Mm. And her in German, which is already a language that com- makes all these cool word combinations, right? Mm. In that language, she's punning. So I feel like the translations sometimes are difficult or take a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's why there, people are kind of slow to Elfrida Jelinek, but especially poets. She's perfect for poets to read. Poets understand Elfrida Jelinek because per- you see the games that she's playing, right? Mm. People who are fiction writers or who are more traditional like readers or experiencers of plays and theater maybe are a little bit intimidated or they shy away from, from, from her. But Elfrida Jelinek. Please read her so I can have someone to talk about. <laughs> I'll read a yeah. Yelenik too. And in, in talking about translation, like with your collection, <clears throat> did you feel some of the, the meaning was lost on one side versus the other? Or, or how did you work around that? The poems are better in Spanish. They're better poems. They're more musical. They have their own references. They're different. They're mm-hmm. not better or worse. They're completely different. So, yeah. oh, sorry, not completely different. But so Natasha Tiniakos, uh, an amazing translator uh, that uh, I met through a friend at Alta. So Alta, I was talking about how deep the Tucson poetry community is. Alta is the American Language Translation Association. I might have the acronym wrong, but it's about, that's just about right. They're based out of Tucson. A good friend who works for them, Kelsey uh, Veneta. Um, got her degree at Iowa and worked with Natasha Tiniakos at, at, at Iowa. And Natasha is also a poet in her own right. We have a lot of similar influences. I gave her free reign to translate this however she wanted. But we worked very closely together on Zoom, many, many, many hours on Zoom because she lives in New York City and I was in Tucson. And so we worked on lines together and she got to ask me all kinds of questions like, hey, what do you mean here? What's this a reference to, right? Mm-hmm. Oftentimes when I'm referencing like music or pop culture, she has her own reference, her own Latin American reference, her own Venezuelan reference, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I mentioned, uh, is it Garth Brooks? No, no. Um, oh, who sings All My Exes Live in Texas? George Strait. Yeah. I think I mentioned George Strait at one point, And then she comes back with a quote from a Juan Gabriel song, mm-hmm. I believe. Or there's some kind of like mix between these things, right? When I mentioned Niagara mm-hmm. Falls in the English, she's mentioning uh, a waterfall in Venezuela, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's a lot on, on purpose. There's different things, right? Yeah. On purpose. I told her, in fact, I wanted this to be even more. I wanted the Spanish to even talk back to the English at one point. Mm. It didn't mm. quite, it didn't quite happen, but I wanted the Spanish to be its own kind of like wild version yeah. without trying to like mimic it. And there's no way because there's so many weird puns and jokes, right? Yeah. That's mm. kind of why I asked that question. I just wondered, uh, you know, what that presented for you, like what challenges when you were working with your editor, but it sounds like you guys were very, I don't know what the word is, but um, I guess since you gave her free reign, like that's really awesome. <laughs> but I, I but I had freedom from the press. I had freedom yeah. from the editor, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a copy editor that gave us a lot of, had a lot of questions mm-hmm. in the Spanish, right? The copy editor work, that took a very long time. But, and we disagreed with the copy editor a lot in the Spanish. He was trying to correct a lot of things in the Spanish. We, we, he was like our enemy. Hmm. Um, in fact, <laughs> I think in the book, I say that my, it was my stepsister. So stet in, when you're editing books, stet means keep it the way it was. That's like just, I don't, I don't know where the, the etymology of that is, right? Hmm. So we were stetting a lot. We're like, stet, no, don't change that. Don't change that. Don't change that. One out of every 10 comments that our, ed- that our copy editor made, though, was amazing and very smart and made the poem better. Mm-hmm. So we had to like consider all, all we couldn't just like blindly stat. Mm-hmm. There was some really great ideas that the copy editor gave, but this is the first time One World did a translation. Oh. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so they kind of gave me free I got to choose my editor. I got to pick Natasha Tiniak. I mean my my translator, excuse me. Um, so we kind of had free reign to kind of do play around with whatever we wanted to in the Spanish. That's awesome. And it does make the reading more rich and, and full of depth, being able to kind of read in both English mm-hmm. and Spanish kind of back to back like that. Yeah, I mean, my Spanish is like, okay, it's not great. It's not great. 
Like I can read it a little bit better than I can speak it for sure. But getting to read my poems in Spanish is amazing. It's like yeah. when you plug a guitar into like a distortion pedal or like a flanger pedal and you're like, oh my God, everything, everything that I was just playing sounds so much better. Um, and here's one thing that's really cool too. I mean, I've got a lot of family that live in the state of Chihuahua that I'm not super close to because they don't speak English very well. I don't speak Spanish very well. This has been an amazing connection to my family in Chihuahua. Mm. They all got copies. They all read it. They remember those cousins and family members that were named Primitivo and Primitiva. Um, so it was a neat way for me to connect with my family that I'm kind of like distant from. Mm. And besides family, has there been good reception for your, your collection? Uh, en el otro lado. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, I got some feedback from the translators and uh, in at Cooney at, at, in New York, because uh, Natasha Tinyakos is from there. And she works with a lot of people from Latin America in, in her program. And one person said that this is the greatest book ever written by the about the Venezuelan border, hmm. uh, even though that's not my intention. But I think there's like <laughs> enough things that that can kind of overlap, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I don't really have my finger on the pulse too much of how, how well it's been received or, or what people think about it, like in, in Mexico or, or in Latin America, right? I'd be, I'd be interested to know. And, you know, we had just read uh, Promises of Gold uh, by Jose Olivares. It has, yeah. right, also the same, like, kind of idea of, like, the Spanish translation. Right. Um, and that one, we do get the, the translator's notes. And so we were actually going to ask if, like, if in the mm. future edition, do you think we could get, like, a translator's note? 100%. 100%, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's also a few things that we want to, like, fix in the Spanish mm. and kind of, like, mm. fix. Um, there, there, yeah, some, there's some weird anomalies in the Spanish that I was actually okay with. But Natasha wasn't, but then it was too early. It was too late to change them. So in a, in a next edition, there will be a translator's note, and there'll be some small edits and changes to, to, the, to the Spanish and maybe, maybe even the English, very small things. Um, yeah, yeah, so hopefully there, there is a second, a second edition and we can kind of like ad address those those things because natasha needs a translator's note yeah, yeah. That, that's just something that would be really nice to read mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. i know yeah that's i think that's something that we just kind of like looked over it was done in a really condensed time and uh, natasha had basically a semester to translate the book mm -hmm. and she worked yeah. incredibly hard like i have to give big props to N N natasha and then after she did that then we had to edit it mm -hmm. and yeah. we edited two books basically the book in english <laughs> yeah. and the yeah. book in spanish right wow. so um, I think the translator's note was something that if we had more time, we would have like be, been able to fit in, but we were on a mm. real tight, tight schedule. Mm. It's impressive. I'm glad you mentioned Jose and translation because in, in Promises of Gold, the translation is split, right? You flip the book over, it's, you can read it in Spanish straight through, flip it over, you can read it in English straight through. This is f facing each yeah. other. And I'm, think, I'm pretty sure that's intentional, right? 100%. Yeah. yeah. I wanted that to be, and we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do it for some reason. Like the, my editor and One World, we were going back and forth as to whether it would be split or f facing. But I was like, it has to be facing. It absolutely has to, right? Because mm. then it, you have the metaphor of the border going down the spine. Mm. Mm. You as a reader can cross back and forth. Mm -hmm. There's other kind of metaphors that it brings up. There's places where the Spanish and English go out of sync because mm. the Spanish is just more verbose, right? Yeah. There's a couple pages where they, there's not an English side mm. on the left, right? Because the Spanish has spilled over. An amazing metaphor, right, for how language can break over a border or break over a barrier. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's just, there's like just more depth added to the book through that. Am I doing my last question? Are we doing a last question? Is it time for that? I mean, so you one guys thing, don't have any other questions? I mean, uh, one thing that we always asked, um, and I'm going to phrase this in a particular way um, Are there any poets or literary works that influenced you, inspired you when? researching or writing about the specifically about writing about the border i think um i think ben signs was a was a big influence his fiction about about what it's like to be from the border and from el paso right that, that was a big inspiration um where i was a little bit familiar with some of his work uh but going back and reading um some of his prose and his poetry you know i think i think that that was a big part of that um, you know, I feel like the, uh, the influences were, were already in place though. I feel like it was already, it was already there. Um, you know, of course I don't, 
I, I would never say that I'm like, I know everything about the border, right? Or know everything about El Paso Juarez, especially Juarez, right? Like, I have a connection there, but I don't know everything about Juarez. I don't know that community or world as well as I know the one from El Paso, right? But that's okay. I don't think I have to. And I felt like I was, I was ready to kind of like spit these poems out and spit this book out. Um, but um, yeah, uh, Albert, Albert Rios, um, he's, a, he's a poet who who influenced me a lot when it came to speaking about the border. Um, Monica de la Torre, um, who's a great translator uh, from New York, uh, but she's from Mexico, um, even though she's not a part of a like a US-Mexico border community like, like from El Paso, but I think she represents kind of like this kind of New York art scene and a Mexican kind of like art scene really well. I think my last question, you kind of mentioned like your copy editor a little bit beforehand and they seem a little like heavy handed and maybe their notes and everything. Um, you have a lot of symbols throughout the collection. Mm -hmm. Did they kind of fight with you on that? Did they agree with having those in there like right off the bat? Did you like have to explain? No, the the symbols weren't a problem at all. They, they were kind of on board with that. Um, I think the copy editor had more notes about the Spanish. There's parts where there's parts where I... Uh, there's a couple times in the book where a poem is kind of fused together with another poem, mm -hmm. right? Like the, a poem mm -hmm. starts right as soon as another one ends. Mm -hmm. And I had to explain like, well, what I wanted, what I'm trying to do there is sneak in a poem where you usually wouldn't find one, right? So if you go to the table of contents too, like there's two poems listed underneath the same page mm -hmm. um, because there's literally two poems there, right? So in that way, I feel like I was breaking a type of border or kind of like moving over a different type of border. You know, the, uh, in the English and the Spanish, there's a lot of times where the line bleeds over, right? Like it's not this clean, clean line. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a happy accident, but also I was okay with that. I was like, okay, well, it's kind of like the line can't even contain the language. The language spills mm -hmm. over. It's kind mm -hmm. of like natural border. Or at least that's how I would try to explain it to myself. Cool. Do you have um, any, like going off of Richie's question, uh, any authors that you feel um, our students should be reading right now? Yeah, I mean, um, like definitely Alfreda Jelinek, but uh, Daniel Borzutsky, <laughs> Rodrigo Toscano. I mean, they, they both blurbed the book. Um, we spoke beforehand about Victoria Chang. I think Victoria Chang is writing some really important, cool uh, poetry right now. Um, Rosa Alcala has a new book that's come that just came out. <laughs> like that should I haven't read it yet, but that's that should be uh, definitely explored and and mined. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's <laughs> that's that's good right there. Yeah. Are you working on a new collection right now, or what are you working on? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I have like three or four small projects, right? Mm -hmm. And like two of them are prose mm -hmm. uh, projects um, cool. because I, I want to try my hand at writing, at writing fiction. Because there's also just, I mean, my goal is to write sentences for a living. It's very, it's, it's, that's a very lofty goal. I know it's not, probably not going to happen, but I just know there's more eyeballs on, on fiction. Mm -hmm. And since, you know, I've, I've got this really cool press that wants to read whatever I, uh, whatever I write next, mm -hmm. I'm like, heck, I'm going to shoot for the stars here and try to, try to write some fiction. It might all turn into mm -hmm. poems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what's been happening. It's like, I'm I write like two or three pages of prose and then eh, I just turn it into a poem. I just like, make line <laughs> breaks and I cut out, you know, like a few, a few things and it just becomes a poem, but I'm going to try I'm trying to write prose. Awesome. Yeah. I just wanted to ask one last thing. Like, if there's any mm -hmm. advice um, that you have for students or aspiring writers, um, like, Absolutely. after having gone through this journey and publishing this collection. Yeah. I mean, um, always think about, even, like, even me, I still think about may, honing my craft, getting mm -hmm. better, right? Finding more ways to add depth to a poem. And then also just writing, write a lot, keep writing, write a ton. You know, like I took a, I mentioned earlier, I took a class with Ben Sines at UTEP. Ben Sines himself admitted in the class that he wasn't a great teacher, right? He said it. He's, he's like, guys, I'm not a great teacher, right? And I kind of agreed with him. But one thing he made us do, which was still good, is he made us write a ton. I think we wrote like 13 short stories that semester, right? Which is like insane. You shouldn't, yeah. write, you shouldn't write that much, right? Like, in a, <laughs> in a semester, you should probably be a little more careful, right? Write a ton. Find ways. And that's why I have these kind of like language machines that mm. I said earlier, where 
I'm not inspired all the time. And I don't have to be. I can just sit down and work through these language machines, like homophonic mm. translations, right? Where you're translating from a language that you can pronounce but not understand, like Romanian or Swedish or something mm. like that. And you're just translating the sound of the poems into English, right? The backward, These backwards mm. uh, prose pieces. Um, I'll get all of that and then I'll throw it into Google Translate and I'll translate it into like three, four different languages and then back into English to try to find like this like kind of like language, right? So just write all the time and write as much as possible. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming and for answering our questions yeah. and for giving us all this advice and anyone who's listening. <laughs> yeah. Th thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor to be on a podcast from El Paso. Um, uh, yeah, I was really happy, really happy to, to talk with you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Literally Literary, recorded at Power at the Pass and brought to you by Border Census. This episode, we continued our discussion on The Border Simulator by Gabriel Dosal. If you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Join us on our next episode and follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep.